Let's say we wanted a robot arm, something simple, to do something for us. You know, like scratch your head. Seems innocuous, right? Just do this. Nuh-uh. It's way more complicated than that. Not only do I have to move my arm at the correct angle, I have to move it to the right spot on my head. The exact spot, which is really important when you got an itch. Which can be hard with a built-in arm, let alone one that isn't attached to your body directly. Then you have to get to that spot and apply pressure, but not too much pressure because you don't want to rip your skin and you don't want to puncture your skull. This is a robot arm, remember. It's made of metal and motors, so there's a lot to think about and a lot to worry about. We need to know what the brain is telling itself, what language the brain is speaking to itself, and we need the computer that you're connecting this robot arm through to understand all of that before we can even approach the idea of putting it near my skull. Isn't that crazy to think about? Yeah. BCIs, or brain-computer interfaces, are really complicated because you're talking about brains. <laughs> what is the language of the brain itself? Is it binary like computers? Is it the language of the user? Do, the, do Spanish brains speak in Spanish or Chinese brains in Chinese, English brains in English, French brains in French? Does the brain have a universal language? Think back to that man moving a rat's tail from earlier. Is that proof that one brain and another speak the same language? Not really, but the brain does have a language and we are learning it. So let's kick into this one and figure it out. Sup, brainos? This is episode two of five on upgrading our brain organs. So make sure that you stick around for all the episodes. Go back if you haven't seen episode one. Here we go. In 1888, Santiago Ramón de Cajal, the Spanish neuroscientist who has the best name ever, discovered the neuron. Well, he actually did it in 1887, published it in 1888, and then he won the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 1906. And he did it for this thing called neuron theory. Basically, neuron theory is the same today as it was a century ago. And Jessica has a little model. This is my model of a neuron, and this is kind of the body of the neuron. And this is like the wire, and this is where the information gets sent to. And so when the body of the neuron decides it wants to send information, it will send an electrical impulse this way. And that electrical impulse creates a magnetic field, an electrical field that can be picked up using an electrode that is in the vicinity of that neuron. And so what you have is a lot of these neurons in your brain that create a lot of activity that we can see using electrodes. But the farther away your electrode is, the harder it is to pick up those signals. And so what we want to do is figure out what is the activity that we're looking for and then how can we record it? The brain definitely communicates in electricity and related ions because the ions are generated through electricity and hormones. And then on top of that, you have high frequency spikes going on. So the spikes are little bursts of electricity. Since everything's electric and it works on basically a threshold, there's like a go-no-go -go threshold. One spike down here, that maybe that spike wouldn't have happened unless your hormones had boosted the threshold a little bit. And so your hormones make you more excitable in certain areas and less in others. So the brain's language isn't just one thing. It's a combination of electricity and hormones. That's Charlene Flesher, by the way. I called her because she looks at brains from the side of an engineer and not a biologist. I'm Charlene Flesher. I've got a PhD in bioengineering where I spent all my time working on intracortical brain computer interfaces to control robotic arms. Basically any engineer who comes naively into neuroscience is like, that's totally solvable with a little bit of math. And then none of the algorithms can can't quite perform as well as humans. And so there's a lot of things in neuroscience that I've seen or that I've seen other people come into and they're just like, how are you guys not solving this yet. It's so simple. And we invite them in and then they don't solve it immediately and they start to appreciate that we're trying our best. You know, scientists are doing really cool stuff, but some of these problems are just, just insane. If anyone is gonna know the language of the brain, it's an engineer who is trying like every single day to listen to the brain and then make a language that a robot could speak from it. So I asked, what is the language of the brain? Like, what is it, how does it talk to itself? So your neurons and your brain communicate with electricity, which is super convenient for BCI researchers because if it was like a chemical, it would be much harder for us to detect these single things going on. If you were using a multimeter, you'd have kind of the same thing where you just want to touch a circuit and see what the voltage is. Is that not crazy? In the future documentary, The Matrix, Morpheus turns a human into a battery. While 
yes, we do have electricity. We don't have enough electricity to actually power anything. That was cool sci-fi, but just the fi part. We generate electricity in the form of ions. They're not electrons like the plug in your wall. Instead, it's charged particles or charged molecules moving through your body. So sodium or potassium, calcium or magnesium, and each element has an electric charge. For example, sodium is positive. So a neuron gets an electrical input by ions moving from cell to cell. Proteins on the cell membrane act like bouncers. So they might let in a sodium ion, which means the cell creates a positive charge within itself. The movement of ions from cell one to cell two moves the charge through our brains. And it happens really fast, really fast. And it's easy to think that's how computers work, right? You switch on and off. You have no charge, then you have a charge, but mm, it's not quite it. So a computer operates on a binary system, so it has zeros and ones. And the brain, some of the neurons operate like that. Some of them are on or off. But then there are also neurons that use a gradient for intensity. So for example, when you sense pain, it's not just is there pain or is there no pain? But you can sense a different gradient of pain, like, oh, it kind of stings to, oh my God, I'm gonna die. So there's all these different gradients for that type of sensation, but there's a threshold for these types of sensations. And so your sensation will be no pain up until a certain point, And then after which there's dedicated neurons that say, okay, now we're on. But then beyond that, there could be a little bit on and a lot on. And so there's different binary systems, but also gradiented systems within the brain. But um, let's say zero is inhibitory and one is excitatory. Yeah, I can't say that word. But um, <laughs> so inhibitory is like, nope, don't turn off, stay off. And then excitatory is like, okay, your turn to pass on this information, take it. Um, so that's kind of- But what is in the information packet? Like, is it- we don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. We don't know. That's crazy. <laughs> oh, that's so weird. It's they're just sending gifts. That's what I feel like. <laughs> sending gifts to each it's, other. It's sending memes. So when a cell wants to communicate something to another cell, it fires an action potential. We call it a spike. It's very quick. It's a little burst. It's one millisecond. Pew. Sends the data. And we are able to record that because it's a really high amplitude relative to the rest of the thing. And by high amplitude, I mean like maybe a hundred microvolts peak to peak. It's a little guy, but you know, we have 200 things monitoring basically 200 individual populations of cells. So you might get up to like three or four cells on a single electrode tip. And so the arrays are four millimeters by four millimeters. They fit on like a dime. Um, but then the array length is 1.5 millimeters. So they go 1.5 millimeters into your brain, which is just enough to go right to where your motor cortex, the areas that you know project your spinal cord, are sending out commands saying, move, move this way, move that way. And so we eavesdrop on these neurons. And so people are typically spinal cord injured. So their brain is perfectly healthy, but they've lost the link between their brain and their limbs. And so instead of restoring that link, because we don't know how yet, we can record the same activity that would normally be happening if you saw it move my arm. And instead we just kind of redirect that to a computer. The computer processes it, decodes it, and then we send that to a end effector. But the thing is, we don't know what processing goes through that neuron's mind for it to know whether or not it needs to inhibit or excite. So that's that's kind of the mystery that we're trying to figure out. They're all like studying different aspects of the same thing. And it's so crazy that you can break down the understanding of how our brain functions into different things. Like it's so crazy. I read things in literature all the time. I'm like, how did you think about that? <laughs> How did you even think to look at that? That's, that's insane. Oh my God, this is so crazy. And it's not over yet. One way to think about the language of the brain is to think neuron on, neuron off, but it's really more neuron signaling, neuron inhibiting other neurons from signaling. So it's not really analogous at all. In a bit in a computer, one bit, zero or one, electrons flip the switch to on or off and that's it. But inside of our heads, each neuron is kind of like its own little computer. The neuron might get lots of different input and then at some point, pow, output. Our brain is constantly on and taking in things all the time from different senses. It's like, okay, so each neuron gets several inputs. How does it know what is what? And how does it know which receiving neuron needs what? So 
that's that's the part that we're trying to understand um, in neural coding. And it still blows my mind to think about it that these little tiny cells receive so much input and then they have to figure it out in microseconds and pass it on to the next one. And I'm a human being and I can't even deal with too many things at once. That said, we can still learn what the brain is doing, even if we can't exactly digitally decode it. And we do that by looking at lots of different brains. We use the brain computer interfaces I mentioned earlier, EEGs, fMRIs, physical electrodes, and we learn the brain's analog patterns. When the brain is doing this, we know that means this. <laughs> and with training, people can control some pretty extraordinary things. The way we decode what's happening in the brain requires us to know what we're looking for. Movement, for example, there are specific areas of the brain that are dedicated to movement. And so when you think, oh, I'm going to flex my bicep a couple of times, a computer can pick up that signature and then you would basically tell the computer what thinking of flexing a bicep looks like in the electromagnetic field. From there, the computer can then tell like a prosthetic arm or something to flex a certain muscle. Basically, there was this linear map between what your neurons are doing and the direction your arm is moving. And on top of that, there's a linear approximation for how you're moving in space, how you're moving your arm in space, and what your neurons are doing. So with those two things, you can put it together and you can start, you know, you can record from a monkey's brain while he's alive and moving around and not paralyzed. And then you try to see how well you can guess where his arm is based on his neural activity. This kind of stuff was done in the 80s and it was the foundation that all of BCI is based on. Did you catch that by the way? The brain is sending linear velocity signals linear. When you want to move your arm to the right, the brain is literally mapping a signal that goes to the right. That is so crazy, right? So let's say that the brain wants to draw a circle. Got my little handy dandy pencil. Let me draw my circle. Not the best circle. Let me try that again. That's, a, that's not bad. That's not bad, actually. The brain has to measure velocity and angle and pressure all in three dimensions. We know how to do this because we monitored thousands of different animal trials using monkeys where they literally drew circles while scanning their brains. Scientists realized which neurons work in the monkey brains for this, making an arm move that's easy, but little finger movements, that's hard. There is a lot to learn when you're drawing the perfect circle. And I am terrible at drawing. I draw occasionally for this show, trying to illustrate something. And I was trying to get better at drawing. So I was watching this Skillshare class by Chantelle Martin. And we're all at home right now, and so I also just needed a hobby. So why not learning to draw? Chantelle said to try drawing rapid fire, or maybe try with music, or try standing up. And all of this was so fun and so weird, and I did actually get better at illustrating things, because I started to practice more, and it was kind of fun. If you want to learn something new, you should check out Skillshare. It's an online community of creative learners who teach each other new skills like graphic design or habit formation, learning to draw, art, marketing, business, web development, video or music production, even tips on how to craft or pick out art to hang on your walls. It's really awesome. Just head over there and you're gonna get two months free with this link. I'm always online searching for how to's and trying to discover new ways to do things for video editing or DIY stuff. But whereas before I went and just randomly searched, now I go to Skillshare first. Join Skillshare with my link. And again, you're gonna get two months of premium membership for free and you can try all sorts of new things and learn something new. And after that, it's only $10 a month to keep it rolling. Skillshare loves creative and curious people who are lifelong learners and I was like, that sounds like my people. So thanks. But let's go back, back to the brain. So the language of the brain depends on a lot of little things. Luckily, it seems to be universal. There are different animal brains that generally work in the same fashion, which means the language of the brain is decodable. But it's not as simple as a computer. It's not binary. It's not on and off. And we haven't even really talked about how it's affected by emotions or if we try to do multiple tasks at a time. Let me go back to Morpheus and what he said. Remember the battery thing? Here's one that's a little more accurate. If real is what you can feel and smell, taste and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. That is the brain's language. And we're trying to listen to it through the wall of our neighbor's apartment and trying to figure out exactly what they're saying. But more on that next time. Thanks to Charlene, Liesel, and Jessica for their help so far. We'll see you on Friday for episode three of five in this series. If you have any questions or want to talk about what you learned today, make sure you head down into the comments. I am Trace, and I will see you in the future.